most certainly this would have been unthinkable they was waiting for a messiah to come for those 400 years to to um, you know establish his kingdom on earth to get them out from under the oppressions of the romans and to think that god was going to come man would have been totally unthinkable and it's my reading of the bible i cannot find anybody who thought jesus was god now they were like you said a little confused not really sure because jesus did not try to market his messiahship he tried to keep it quiet but there was many people who uh well you take when he was being born uh god told the angels in heaven to worship him to, he was being born of course god was in heaven and, it, and he told them to worship worship the, the son he was being born and of course we have that in the luke narrative and we have the lineage in luke and matthew that traces all the way back to adam and traces jesus's lineage back through he had to be a human through david the lineage of david but the spirit you know through god i'm getting a little mixed up here yeah, but, but all the people but all the I people grant, i want to acknowledge for so we got time we got weeks well, on this I want to acknowledge. Well, you tell me. That, well, you're expressing your disagreement that you don't believe that. I'm, not, I'm telling you from what I read, read from the Bible story, and please, well, I don't mean. Do that's what I'm saying. Weeks, I have not read anything. Because what we're going to do. start with Paul. In Romans chapter 1, Romans 1, verse 3, <coughs> we're looking at, it's just a snippet, um, because snippets is all we have here. But I want to start in verse 1 just so you can kind of get a flow of it. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among the Gentiles for the sake of his name, including yourselves, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Um, verse 3, and, and after verse 4, I want us to be very modest and not read more into Paul than Paul says right here. That's one of the fundamental things I learned about reading the Bible when I went to seminary was, let the Bible speak for itself, 
Don't project onto the Bible more than it says. Let it have its own voice. And trust that, you know, the, the Word will speak to us. So Paul talks about the Gospel concerning God's Son. Now, don't assume yet that when Paul says Son, that means what, for instance, John says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Don't assume that when Paul says Son, he means everything that the doctrine of the Trinity implies, because it doesn't have to mean that. Um, it, he does say that the Son was descended from David according to the flesh. So That's it, what I was trying to quote while coming. It says that the Son of God, Jesus, was born human in the lineage of King David. Okay? So there's no explicit claim to deity there. He's not trying to claim deity there. He's trying to claim what you know the, the lineages say in Matthew and Luke that in Jesus' human ancestry, he is from the line of King David, which makes him the Jewish Messiah, which makes him the one they anticipate, expected. Then it gets really interesting. Was declared to be Son of God with power according to the Spirit of Holiness by resurrection from the dead. So Paul has in the same sentence the birth of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. Now, once again, don't read in this more than what is there. Because it can easily be claimed, and many people will claim, that what made Jesus Son of God was his resurrection. It was not some sort of pre-existence. It was not necessarily what John would say, that he existed before the world and then took on flesh. I'm not saying Paul doesn't believe that, but according to this, Paul wants to hold up that Jesus was descended according to David in the Messianic line, and Jesus was declared to be, or demonstrated to be, Son of God because he was raised from the dead. If you don't have the resurrection from the dead, then you don't have, in Paul's mind, the Son of God. So we, we're not trying to take anything away from what John would say that Jesus existed before anything else existed and took on human flesh. We're just trying to hear what Paul's saying about Jesus. And, and at the beginning, he wants to stress he was born according to David's line. That's what makes him Messiah. But he had to be raised from the dead in order for the world to see that this is, in fact, God's Son, whatever that means. It's his resurrection that makes him uniquely God's Son. Now, that's not all earth shattering, is it? I mean, we kind of know that. We believe that. And all we're doing here is exercising restraint not to project too much onto Paul yet. could not do 
by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. So the language Paul uses is God sent his own son in the likeness of human flesh. Um, There is not an awful lot of explanation of this. What is interesting is the son language and the sent language. God sent his son. Um, You might construe from that, as some do, that that meant that Jesus lived with the Father and came from heaven to earth. That would be a fair conclusion. It's not a definite or slam dunk conclusion, but it's a completely reasonable conclusion to draw that Jesus lived with the Father and was sent from heaven to earth to be born in the flesh. That is, in fact, what Hebrews would say, and we'll look at Hebrews next week. Hebrews is explicit about it. Paul, though, you can't say, well, definitely that's what he meant. What you get is Paul says that God sent Jesus. And that's as far as I'm going to take it. We don't have a doctrine of the Trinity. So, again, it would be a fair kind of conclusion to draw 
that Jesus came to earth from somewhere else. That he was not just um, born like any other person was born, but was somehow had a coexistence with the Father, some sort of Eternal generation. Pardon? Internal, eternal generation. Pre existence. Jesus pre existed. Maybe. Maybe. And that's, in Priscilla, that's question. Pre-existence of Jesus. Pre-existence. Did Jesus pre-exist? Because, with, because to have the Trinity, he had to pre-exist. To have a Trinity, he had to pre-exist. Right. Well, I mean, let's say it this way. The pre-existence is a concept that helps us try to understand yeah. how it is that Jesus and the Father are one. Uh, pre-existence was not a notion that was common in, in among the Jews. But that's very, you know, it's very slight. It's hard to get a, you know, a real clear notion that the Jews, that any Jew would believe in pre-existence. The way they saw it, you didn't exist. God formed you in your mother's womb. You were made. That's when you became, began to be. So the notion of pre-existence is one that, and we will see it in later uh, passages, in fact, we may see a little bit of Philippians tonight, to try to get a handle on how is it that someone who was born and whom we saw face to face was somehow one with God. Um, I don't think you get it in that passage clear. What you get is God sent his son. And that raises the question, well, if God sent his son, where was he before he was sent? That's what you get. But let, do me a favor then and just turn a few pages to Philippians 2. As Priscilla named it, the question is, did Jesus exist before he was born? And so far, there's been no proof of that. There's been no clear statement from Paul in Romans and Galatians that Jesus existed before he was born on the earth. Yeah. How do we come by the term, as many people use, God the Son? We, got, we know we got God the Father, then we say God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So many people will think God the Son, and they'll go back to Genesis, let us make man in our image, referring to God as speaking to to his second manifestation, his Son. But basically, God the Son is nowhere in the Bible, but you hear Christians speak of God the Son. Well, well that he, comes from that the he, doctrine that, of the Trinity. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. it absolutely does. Sure. Because Jesus did not pre-exist. Sure. Lots of, lots of terminology Christians use comes it's from, from the doctrinal, doctrinal developments mm -hmm. that are quotations of the Bible. Well, can I ask it's very person? hard to offer Christian witness <clears throat> by only quoting the Bible. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it's very hard it's very hard to live your life by only quoting things that have already been said. So nobody is denying that the Christian witness includes terminology and phraseology that is not a direct quotation from the Bible. That's the only way it could be if the church is going to continue to make witness to God. And so, yes, the term God the Son is not in the Bible, but it is born out of the church's witness to Jesus Christ. Yeah. 
Existence of Peter said that Jesus was preordained and in the foreknowledge of God. So Jesus did not pre-exist before he existed, but he was in. Peter said he was preordained, predetermined, and in the foreknowledge. And now, also, I, wait, I, wait, I, wait, no, wait, wait a minute, I got. No, stop for a minute. Well, I'm in charge of this class. Well, let me and, just. And I am happy to have you here. Well, I'm just. And trying, happy to have your participation. You won't let but me talk. I will. I, it's my class. Well, I'm I very. Let you talk well, I wrote a book about this. I'm very educated, and I just you quoted Peter, and then you said, and therefore Jesus did not pre-exist. You cited one scripture, and you said, therefore Jesus did not pre-exist. That did not say Jesus did not pre-exist. So I will 
correct you All right. when you make claims I, that are greater I, Peter said than that. the evidence allowed. Peter said that. I'm and we are not in Peter tonight. We are in Paul. Well, I, well, and we will get to Well, I have one more thing. Let me just say one more thing. No, modern no, day, modern day no please respect that we are going to be patient. We have nine weeks of this, and we're going to go through all the passages, and, and I do not believe that will yes. reflect poorly upon you. I know it. I know it will. Now, Philippians 2. You don't want anyone else to talk. You are doing all the talking, and I have uh, a I have a vote. How many times has Priscilla talked tonight? One, two, three, Priscilla. You have talked, so do not make a false claim. I, 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 you have talked almost as much as I have. That so is not so. You are welcome to, I, I'm serious about this. Your presence is valued here. Your perspective is valued here. But you may not dominate the class. Please I'm, participate in the class. I didn't realize I was dominated. I'm sorry. Um, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Here is more about the question of pre-existence. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ. Those not regarding quality with God is something to be exploited. But you won't let me talk. I know what I'm talking about. that I have, but you don't understand, Stuart, they said that I'm reinforcing them here. I'm trying to be respectful, but I do know things. I have studied this. I have more, actually, I'm more knowledgeable about this than you are. So thank you say it, though, does it make it? Well, I'm only saying what Peter, I'm only saying Peter said that Jesus was preordained, and for, which was your answer to preexistence. Peter said he was in the mind of God. He preexisted, except not preexisting as a human, but in the foreknowledge of God before he was born. So I'm just trying to clarify these things, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do. That he was pre. What does he was mean? in the mind of God. Thank you for expressing your view. Class, we are going back.
brought you back last night. I sent one earlier today. Oh, no, I didn't get one today. I mean, I didn't check my emails today. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm still pretty much holding on that, that original offer that I okay. made for time at the end of class. If anyone at the end of stuff. class? Well, did you misunderstand why I say it? I meant... I wouldn't take up any class time other than just to ask the question, not exceed five, four or five minutes just to ask the questions or make present a different perspective. Yeah, you know, think. based on all the knowledge and the research I've done over the last eight years, that I wouldn't try to, you know, take up too much time, but just offer a different perspective or ask but the question. And, 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 and I want to be very respectful. But I'm saying I want to honor the class. Well, I understand. Home, I never meant... I'm the teacher, and so what I've said is I would offer you if people would like to stay at the end of class, five Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is, do you not want me to, do you not want me to participate in class with questions or statements? Do you want that to be left after class and not to I'm, participate I'm in class? I'm happy to have the, the conversation, but it can't be like last week. Well, I agree with you. I certainly agree with you. That was very um, upsetting to me. I wrote you a, 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 a letter of apology. I was very sorry that it got out of hand. And that's, I didn't mean for it to, and I'm very sorry, but uh, no. I just don't know if you don't want me to participate because, you know, the fact that I will have maybe a different perspective because, well, you know, the book that I wrote sure. and the research, I sometimes will have a different perspective or ask the question, but I'll do it very respectfully. But if you don't want me to do it within the classroom setting and have the same privilege that the other students have, you know, instead of asking me to wait to after class, I don't think that is a very ethical thing to do. Well, I think that's what I'm saying. That's what you want me to do, then, to wait yeah, till after that's class? What I'm saying. Okay, not. Uh, I regret that. I really don't want to be that way, but I think that is the way it's going to happen. Well, well I, I'm sorry, too, Stuart. I, I guess one could only placate that on, on a case of fear. I mean, if you're fear of opposition or anything I might say. So, but I'm, I'm sorry, I can't be reduced. Well, look at me, Priscilla. Obviously, I am terrified. Obviously, I do not feel equipped to deal with this. To what? Obviously, I don't feel equipped to deal with this subject. It's clear. And so, you know, make whatever conclusion you need to make. Well, okay. I just... Let's go ahead and get started then. Um,